Well, good afternoon. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm David Vaskovich. I work here at Microsoft and am responsible for the part of the company that focuses on the opposite of desktop computing. I'm really thinking about what we call enterprise computing, which is what's involved in making it possible to run an organization or part of a business with personal computers, networks of personal computers, and servers. So with that as a lead-in, I'd like to talk about some of the problems that our customers and people that I've talked to all over the world have run into as they try to figure out how to think about computers differently than they ever have before. We'll start with this two by two matrix. Now, it's a fact that in the consulting world, there are East Coast consultants in the US and West Coast consultants. East Coast consultants always use two by two matrices and West Coast consultants always use three by three matrices. So you can always tell somebody's background by the type of tables that they use. In order to be sure that you can't classify me, I've taken care to use both a two by two and a three by three matrix throughout this presentation. So we'll start out with the East Coast perspective. And here, in this somewhat oversimplified view of the world, we get to see the problem from a customer's perspective. So let's suppose that you're responsible for setting information technology strategy for an organization, or perhaps advising somebody who's doing that. You look around you, and you see that technology is changing at a truly scary rate, and you're trying to figure out what to do about that. At the same time, as you pick up the papers, read about business process re-engineering, downsizing, and all the rest of it, you realize that the fundamental business model, the way that organizations function, the way that companies compete globally, is changing at the same time. And the problem that you face is to figure out which of these shifts is more important. Is it just a technology shift? Is it just a business shift that you have to deal with? Or is it somehow both? That's the dilemma that this two by two matrix shows. Now what we see here are all the various possible ways of thinking about it. For example, in the lower left corner of the matrix, we see what happens if you think about continuing to do things the same old way technologically, and also continuing to do things the same old way from a business perspective. Frankly, that's what the majority of organizations worldwide are doing, tuning their existing organizations, tuning their existing business systems. If I made a bet with you and said, OK, you can have the car of your choice if you can find a dozen large organizations who have taken significant, maybe even mission critical, high throughput applications running on a large mainframe today and move them into a production mode so that they're running on a PC LAN. The mainframe might still be there, but that particular application has moved. And what you have to do is find a dozen of these shifted or applications in order to win the car. I wouldn't go out and consider what color of car to get because you'd find you'd have a hard time finding those organizations. And the reason is that everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. Now, the first thing that happens as they start to realize that they can't keep thinking about this forever and it's time to do something, the first thing that happens is there's this terrible temptation to think that what's happening is simply a technological shift. Everybody knows that personal computers today, for under $5,000, deliver some of the performance and capacity of the mainframes of the 60s. So clearly, by simply shifting applications, if it were possible to do that, from mainframes to personal computers, potentially we could save a lot of money and deliver friendlier applications to users. That's sometimes called downsizing. The problem with downsizing is that it basically doesn't work. The idea that you can take a large, sophisticated application written around perhaps a TP monitor like CICS, maybe a sophisticated database like IMS or DB2, and convert it, largely unchanged, to run in a PC LAN, turns out on closer examination to not really be doable. You can move the application, but you have to rewrite it in the process. And that process of rewriting turns out to be hugely expensive. Now, in the lecture circuit, where people go around giving speeches about downsizing all the time, it's become fashionable to refer to downsizing as, as right-sizing. Downsizing has all these negative connotations of firing people and getting rid of things that we used to like. Right-sizing sounds so much more attractive. The problem is that right-sizing is really a euphemism. 
It's a euphemism for mainframes are real computers, PCs are toys, let's move all the small applications from the mainframe to the PC. And that way, we get back some capacity on the mainframe, give the users the appearance of running real applications on the PC, and everybody's happy. The problem is it doesn't solve the bigger problem, the fact that mainframes are too expensive, the fact that we can't get at real data through our PCs, the fact that it takes too long to develop applications on the mainframe, the fact that applications developed on the PC can be built quickly, but they can't talk to the database. So we really do need to downsize after all. The problem is that we have to find a justification not for converting our applications, but in fact for rewriting them from the beginning. That justification lies in the lower right square of this table, business process reengineering. For all the fact that downsizing may not be happening, business process reengineering absolutely is. Companies are, in fact, downsizing their organizations. They're finding ways to do more with fewer people. They're finding ways to respond to customer problems more quickly, to build products for less money. And in the process of doing that, they're discovering something interesting. That on the one hand, business process reengineering is something that every organization of any significant size has to do. And it can't be done without new technology. It turns out, as we will see in the course of this particular tape, that in order to really build re-engineered business systems, we also have to build a new type of information technology, a new type of computer system that makes the fundamental business process re-engineering really possible. And that leads to a breakthrough. The breakthrough is that the cost savings associated with business process re-engineering provide the budgetary wherewithal to rewrite those mainframe-based systems, not convert them, rewrite them, rewrite them from the ground up to take advantage of the new technology and have it appear to be a f an attractive proposition financially. So that's what this is really all about. And underneath it all, it turns out the common thread is a way of thinking both about organizations and about computers that revolves around processes. Processes instead of tasks, processes instead of data, process thinking is a recipe for revolution. So the question is, how do we get to these new systems? How do we understand the organizational changes? How do we understand the new technology? And if we're talking about building systems in a completely new way, how do we think about those new systems? Here's the problem. We're riding a 20-year wave. About 1950, commercial computers were really first became practical. And through the course of the 60s and the 70s, organizations started to figure out what it meant to really use computers to run their companies. The original forecasts that IBM would be lucky if it could sell a couple of dozen computers worldwide turned out to be far short of the mark. And by around 1970, organizations were absolutely surprised at the huge amount of money that they were spending on their mainframe technology. The good news was, though, that the batch systems that they had built so painfully over the last 20 years were finally starting to work, and these organizations thought that they could see the end in sight. Printed reports, punched cards, batch runs. It may seem primitive today, but in those days, it appeared marvelous, and it worked. Then, all of a sudden, in less than five years, everything changed. Disks and online storage, terminals and wide area networks, the concept of database. All five of those things were invented all at the same time. Suddenly, the company president, the CEO, was reading about database in the Harvard Business Review, hardly a technical periodical. All of a sudden, companies realized that unless they found a way to reorganize the way their companies ran around the concept of database, a concept that involved terminals spread out throughout the organization so that the database could always be up to date, so that customers could call up and order inventory knowing whether or not they would receive their product wherever the inventory was located. Companies that didn't make the shift to online database-oriented computing were not going to be competitive. All of a sudden, it became mandatory to rewrite all of those expensive, painfully built systems, cost no object. Now, that was 20 years ago. In the last 20 years, we have not seen any other technical shifts 
that have had the same kind of widespread impact on the business. Sure, DEC and the VAX, with its concept of interactive time sharing, made large scale computing simpler. It made it easier and perhaps a little less expensive, but it hardly changed the entire dimensions of the computing environment. So basically what happened is that over the last 20 years, we relearned how to think about computers. And we, once we had figured out how to do it, we didn't have to relearn it again. It's been 20 years since we had to re-examine our fundamental concepts. Well, guess what? We're now in the middle of another 20-year wave. And all of a sudden, all the things that we learned so painfully about how to build systems, how to run systems, how to design systems, all of those things have to be rethought. They may not be wrong, but they have to be reorganized in new and different ways, and some new concepts have suddenly become very important. And it's the fact that this shift has so far only happened every 20 years that has made it so difficult for us to be prepared for dealing with it. Now here we see the obligatory 3x3 three three matrix. And this 3x3 three three matrix really demonstrates the dimensions of dealing with this conceptual problem. If we look at the bottom row, which has, of course, three columns because it's a 3x3 three three matrix, we see the structure of a physical application. There is a business dimension to it, an application dimension to it, and a technical dimension. The technical dimension deals with the hardware, the operating systems, the database technology, the networking infrastructure. The business side of it, of course, deals with the actual business needs that are being met. And in the middle is the application, the application software which takes the technology and makes it meet the needs of the business. And of course, because we're talking about the physical role, we're talking about the actual products, the actual running software, the actual business requirements that are being met. During the last 20 years, one of the most difficult things for most builders of applications to learn is that there's a layer above the physical layer, a layer called logical a layer in which we think about the structure of an application, its fundamental design, before we start building it. Every hour spent in design typically sa saves anywhere from 10 to 100 hours in actual development and subsequent maintenance. So the fact that during the past 20 years, and particularly during the 80s, we were able to come up with models for thinking about the logical structure of the business, the logical structure of the application, and the logical structure of the technology itself, network diagrams, database diagrams, and all the rest, has enabled a huge breakthrough in terms of being able to design and build more effective applications. There's a problem, though. It turns out that many of the very structures, many of the logical concepts that we built up so painfully over the last 20 years have now become wrong, sometimes in big ways, sometimes in small ways, sometimes in terms of how all of those structures are related to each other. Let me illustrate. A customer of ours had received approval from senior management to redesign a major system to move it into a client server world. The justification for this was all correct, based on business process re-engineering, self-managed teams, increased autonomy at local offices, reduced centralization, reduced costs, all the standard things, all correct. This system, it, the rewrite of this system was a $60 million project with a large number of internal staff and a wide variety of consultants. About 18 months into this five-year project, we found that there was a lot of thrashing going on. People were dealing with basic questions. Now, everybody knew what was supposed to happen on the desktop. The desktop was supposed to have personal computers, be graphical, provide linkages to personal productivity tools. And everybody understood the role of the mainframe, but what about the servers? How many servers should there be? Should we have one big database? Should we have databases at every office? How about regional databases? A few regional databases? Many regional databases? Maybe a combination of all these things. How do we decide? At this point, a variety of data and other application models have been developed. In fact, Considering the amount of time and money that was spent, it's not surprising that there were over 60 binders full of data models and other diagrams available supposedly to answer this question. The problem is that none of the models, none of the methodologies, none of the binders, none of the diagrams provided any answers. One day, after about a month and a half of thrashing, somebody asked, how do we know we're drawing the right diagrams? 
Maybe there's some other class of diagram we should be drawing, some other type of model, some other way of thinking about the problem that would make the answer to these questions seem obvious. And the more they thought about it, the more they realized that the reason that they had been approaching the problem in the way they had, drawing the diagrams that they had, thinking about the problem in that way, was because <clears throat> that was the way everybody had always done it for 10, 15, even 20 years. Perhaps the boxes were drawn slightly differently in one place than another. Perhaps the lines were drawn in slightly different ways, but the fundamental concepts were still based on the database and time-sharing revolution of the early 70s. So what this diagram illustrates is that in order to move into the client-server world, we have to deal with a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts involve new concepts. And unless you allocate time in your projects to think about those new concepts, what they are and where they apply, you will end up spending the time when you can least afford it. Spending the time to deal with the shifts and the conceptual foundation associated with moving to client-server is not optional, it's mandatory. The only thing that's under your control is when you do it and how much rework it causes. To understand more about this shift that we're going through, this particular graphic shows the change in the world from a Microsoft perspective. And then on the next graphic, we'll see the shift in the world from a customer perspective. Microsoft, historically, and even today, has been a desktop vendor. We sell desktop applications, desktop operating systems, desktop graphical environments, and that's where we've been successful. Even though we have server-based products, the majority of our business in the past, today, and in the immediate future is on the desktop. Recently, we went through our first shift. Desktops went from being standalone to being plugged in. All of a sudden, you could suck data into your spreadsheet and build sophisticated databases. Nonetheless, all the work was done on the desktop. Even more recently, with the introduction of products like SQL Server and Access, it became possible for customers to actually start writing smaller tactical applications that operated directly with shared data. The next major shift for Microsoft as a company with the introduction of NT and some years into the future our object-oriented operating system Cairo will be to finally make it possible for organizations to start running significant parts of their business in a client-server world. So, if it's a shift for you, it's a shift for us as well. Here's the exact dimensions of the shift. And the problem has to do with the size of the application. Everybody knows by now that building small applications in a PC environment is incredibly fast and easy to do compared to doing it anywhere else. A small application built with Power Builder and SQL Server can be put together in a matter of hours or at most days in a methodology-free environment with a minimum of external support. The application will be fast, friendly, and flexible. The problem is what happens when it comes time to building bigger applications. What do I mean by bigger? Well, there isn't any precise dividing line. A bigger application might be one with a higher throughput rate. It might be one that has more than a certain number of records in the database. For sure, any application that involves multiple servers or multiple geographical sites is almost certain to fall into the category of bigger applications. And the problem is that those tools that work so well, those methodology-free approaches that work so well for building small applications, just don't work at all when it comes to building the bigger applications. So what do we do when we need to build a bigger application? Now, one question we might ask is, why do we even need to build bigger applications in a PC environment? That's where we get back to business process reengineering. What is business process reengineering really about? The first thing is to understand where business process reengineering comes from. Somewhat surprisingly, since it's primarily applied to office environments, business process reengineering really comes from the factory. Just after World War II, as Japan was starting to rebuild its economy, the concept of total quality management played a key role in the ability of Japanese organizations to become world-class competitors. The concept behind total quality management 
revolves around understanding every part of the processes associated with building large assemblages, including cars, videotape recorders, or whatever. And it involves a fundamental shift from a world where complex machines are built by unthinking robot-like workers on an assembly line to a new world where products are built by self-managed teams, where people are basically responsible for the quality of every part they built so that no part of any product has any defects. In a word, in a word what we're talking about is a shift from task-oriented manufacturing to rethinking factories so that they become based entirely on self-regulating processes. Now, moving a factory from a task assembly line organization to an organization revolving around self-regulating processes involves rethinking every single aspect of the factory. Once we start to think about all of the activities going on in any manufacturing environment, one of the things that starts to become clear is that every step every task, every activity in a process costs money. And once you start to realize that, you start to think about ways to eliminate some of those tasks because you're aware of how much they're costing. That's where process re-engineering comes from. Now, there's another way to think about business process re-engineering. Business process re-engineering, reduced to its essentials, from a mechanical perspective, is flowcharting. That's right, flowcharting. Remember how we all used to like to draw flowcharts in the 60s and 70s? At the core of the mechanical part of business process reengineering is the idea of taking the complex processes that drive an organization, laying them all out on the wall, and then looking at those process charts to figure out which steps can potentially be eliminated. Now, on this chart, we see one of the core ideas behind business process reorganization. This is a model for a classical organization. At the top, we have an executive team headed up by a CEO <clears throat> who is responsible for producing a vision for how that organization is going to run. At the bottom, we have frontline employees responsible for building products, interacting with customers, and solving problems. In the middle, we have where all the coordination happens. Coordination in a large organization is a huge problem. In fact, the largest single problem associated with growing from a very small organization where everybody can literally see and talk to everybody else into a big organization is finding a way to keep that organization coordinated. The classical solution to this problem is to have a huge middle management layer, to have individuals responsible for decisions like credit authorization, inventory allocation, customer exception processing. All the rules, all the decision making happens in the middle of the organization and that way policy frameworks can be interpreted in a consistent and logical fashion. The problem with this model is that the people at the bottom, the people responsible for building the products and dealing with the customers, don't have the ability to make any decisions. If they can't make decisions, they can't regulate themselves. If they can't regulate themselves, they can't do a perfect job. So, the solution to this problem is to push the business rules, the decision making, the coordination, the responsibility for building perfect products, the responsibility for customer satisfaction to the bottom of the organization, as this pyramid shows. Now, here's where it all comes together. So, we're reorganizing the processes of a business. We're looking at a flowchart, we're very clever, and we figured out how to eliminate half the boxes in the flowchart. If that flowchart applied to a computer program, the next step would be simple. We'd rewrite the computer program, feed it into the computer, and the computer, being the idiot savant that it is, does exactly what we tell it to. Let's suppose now that we're doing the same thing in a factory or an office environment. We reorganize the business process, and we go out to frontline employees, some of which have been part of our company for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, people who have been told that they're not allowed to make decisions. They can't make exceptions for customers. They can't change the way the organization runs. And all of a sudden, we're saying to them, make decisions. You are responsible for customer satisfaction. You are responsible for product quality. You are responsible for producing products in less time with no errors. There are two problems associated with doing this. 
the larger problem actually, the one that I'm not going to deal with in this presentation, is that what we're talking about is a huge, significant cultural shift. Fortunately, it's a cultural shift that once people understand it, they get very enthusiastic about it because it's associated with job enrichment and personal empowerment. At the same time, the idea of eliminating a lot of the distinctions between managers and workers, between decision makers and the people actually responsible for interacting with the customer is a painful process to work through. The other problem, of course, is that making all of this work requires a completely new infrastructure, and that's what the rest of this presentation is about. On this diagram, we see the three 20-year waves drawn again, this time in their correct perspectives. The 20-year waves are about technology, but much more importantly, they're really about a new cultural perspective. Three 20-year waves that are reflected in terms of the fundamental underlying organizational business and technical culture that those waves really empowered. The first wave, the wave of batch, was associated with processing discrete tasks. The second wave involved the concept of online database, a business concept, not a technical concept. The third wave, as we shall see, really revolves around the concept of focusing on processes from a business perspective and empowering both the individuals, the organization, and providing the infrastructure to make that empowerment work so that those processes operate more effectively. So from a planning perspective, Here's what's really required. A lot of people, when they think about client-server, for example, think about either technical planning or application planning, the things that you see at the bottom. And there's no question about the fact that in order to build a new generation of client-server applications, we need an application architecture plan. And then with it, we need an, a plan for a new information technology infrastructure. More than that, though, we need a reason for doing it. We need a driving force, and that can only come from a vision of the business. A vision of the business, in turn, can lead to a paradigm shift. The thing about paradigm shifts that it's most important to understand is that they frequently deal with apparent contradictions. One organization, confronted with steadily declining market share, decided that the only way that it could compete with a new class of competitors was by re-emphasizing customer service as delivered through the sales force. At the same time, however, confronted with a different set of economic realities, they decided that they had to reduce sales costs. A more powerful sales force, reduce sales costs, how do we do both of those at the same time? That kind of contradiction is where paradigm shifts often come from. In examining their sales costs, the organization discovered that a significant portion of those costs was tied up in bricks and mortars, physical sales offices that salesmen reported to. Examining what the salesmen did at the sales offices indicated that the primary function was putting data into terminals, that is, entering orders, and pulling reports out of printers, that is, sales history. Well, how about giving every salesman a laptop computer, giving them dial-up access, and closing down the sales offices. A year into the project, testing it out in three territories, the company discovered that they were able to increase customer satisfaction, increase the size of their sales force by 5%, and reduce overall sales costs by 3%. Everything came out of the paradigm shift, which led to fundamentally redesigned processes, which in turn led to a clear set of goals that drove the design of both the applications and the infrastructure to support it. That's the kind of process that really leads to redesign organization-wide. Now, people have known for quite a long time that designing applications in a vacuum is a problem. In fact, the leading methodology for designing large-scale commercial applications is called information engineering. And it's depicted as a pyramid here, borrowed from one of the leading textbooks describing the classical information engineering methodology. At the top of the pyramid is a process called information systems planning. Information systems planning involves exactly the kind of strategic planning that I've just described, examining critical success factors, looking at key operating problems, and looking at ways to fundamentally reconceptualize the business as a way of driving the selection of applications and their design. The problem is that classical information engineering 
has only had moderate success as a way of driving information system strategic planning up into the organization. And there's a reason why. It turns out that there is a pendulum at work here, a pendulum that is in fact swung too far. Twenty years ago, when databases were first invented, a fundamental shift took place in the way that we thought about applications. Before the invention of database, all application design, all application planning, revolved around the concept of functions, the things that the application did, their behavior, the programming. Starting in the early 70s, people began to realize that a much more effective way of thinking about a set of applications was to think about those applications in terms of the central database, to have the database be the center of the world, and to have the applications revolve around the data. This got to the point where by the late 80s, some leading proponents of application design methodologies actually suggested that it was possible to design entire applications by thinking about the data and only the data. And that's a problem. In fact, as we'll see, the fundamental shift that has to take place to make it possible to even design effective client-server applications at all, let alone well, is a shift back to a more balanced perspective, a perspective that recognizes the importance of database, yes, but also recognizes the importance of function and substitutes at the center of the world for data the concept of process. Now, let's be clear about what's really happening in large organizations. In theory, senior management over the years has become increasingly informed about computers, information technology, and information systems. And as the computer people have become more business oriented, they have found a way to do strategic planning with their senior management. In fact, that's not really the way it's turned out. And the reason, one of the fundamental reasons, is because the classical information engineering approaches are so database-centered. Think about the following question. We've all heard stories about people who have focused too much in doing information systems strategic planning and have eventually actually been fired for the fruits of their efforts. Why did they get fired? Because they spent two, three, four years developing a strategic plan that had no pragmatic significance. Now, what could somebody do for three or four years developing a plan? Fill up binders? Sure, they could fill up binders. What did they fill them up with? The answer is data models. The idea that if we just had a complete enough and coherent enough model of the corporate database at the center of the organization, somehow senior management would understand that, A, and B, we could turn it into a strategic plan, has turned out to be wrong. Now, here's the bigger problem. While we've been doing that, what's senior management been doing? Senior management, yes, they have been doing strategic planning. How have they been doing it? They've been hiring their own consultants. These consultants are not computer consultants. They're planning consultants. And guess what they call their strategic planning? Business process reengineering. Guess what business process reengineering revolves around? Processes. It revolves around functional behavior. It revolves around drawing flowcharts. That's right, you're not supposed to draw flowcharts. You're supposed to focus on the structure of the database. Guess what? Senior management has decided they don't want to do that. They're doing their own strategic planning. They're having a party, and we haven't been invited. So basically, the challenge that we have to solve is now that senior management is finally doing strategic planning, how can we be part of that process? The thing that we have to get most clear in our mind the thing that I've been leading up to is that we need a new set of concepts, and that's what I'm about to start developing, a new set of concepts. In order to make room, not just in our minds, but in our hearts and our souls for these new concepts, we also have to be prepared to explode some preconceptions. And in particular, we have to be prepared to be less religious. For all of its apparent technical purity, the computer industry, information technology as a whole, is one of the most religious areas in the world. People end up espousing particular points of view and then decide that those points of view are right because they're right. And so what we need to do is to find a way to get past some of those religions, to find a way to go back to ground zero and th rethink from the beginning what computer systems, applications, and businesses are really all about.
To facilitate that process, I'd like to introduce four basic questions that I'm then going to answer. Those four questions, answered properly, provide a framework for designing and building effective client-server systems. The first question, then, is what does the mainframe do? Now, this seems like a really obvious question to many people. I ask them, what does a mainframe do? And they talk to me about CICS, about MVS, about DB2. Those are technologies and products. Those are things that facilitate the operation of the mainframe. They're not what the mainframe is about. So what is the mainframe about? In the personal computer industry, there certainly is a clear picture of what a mainframe does. And somewhat surprisingly, many mainframe people share this view. And that view is the mainframe is a database. Or perhaps the mainframe is just a database. If we had a big enough server, a fast enough server, running a sophisticated enough database, then obviously that server could replace the mainframe, because after all, the mainframe is just the database. This, in turn, leads to an application architecture. The application architecture has two layers, not surprisingly, given the view that the mainframe is a database. On the desktop are applications written with a variety of tools. We happen to believe that BASIC is one of the central languages for writing those tools, but there are a variety of other alternatives, including Smalltalk, C, and so on. At the back, on the other hand, there's an almost unanimous agreement that the central language is SQL. Now, this is particularly ironic, given the fact that over 80% of the world's true production data lives in non-relational environments, like IDMS, IMS, vSAM, and RMS, Nonetheless, most experts agree that the back end of future applications will be a database, a relational database, revolving around SQL. Now, this approach raises a variety of interesting problems. For example, customers come to visit us here at Microsoft, and they hear a presentation. Quite often, the application architecture is not laid out explicitly. But nonetheless, it's not very hard to deduce that there are the, the two layers, the front end and the back end. And then they start to wonder. What happened to COBOL? I mean, nobody talks about it. It's like it's impolite. Maybe it's dead. In fact, maybe it died so long ago that people can't even remember that it ever existed. Now, this is particularly bizarre and ironic because it is still true that the largest population of professional programmers in the world by far makes their living every day writing code in COBOL. And yet, we won't even admit that COBOL exists. And in fact, in our application architecture, where would it exist? Would it be on the desktop? I don't think so. Is it in the database? Not in the database. What about if you use a case tool? That case tool generates code to handle the business rules. Where does that code go? Into the database? Onto the desktop? Or perhaps you have a rule-based business rule application. Where do the rules go? Now, let's flip this around. Let's say that we have a large application. We have a blacked out warehouse. You know, a warehouse that has $60 million of inventory, and there are no humans in it. Instead, we have robot forklift trucks that go around, pick inventory, trucks are scheduled by a computer, and all delivery assignments are automatically allocated. We have 1.2 million lines of Fortran, PL1, C, and assembler code that drives that warehouse. And now we want to convert it to client-server. What do we do with the code? Run it on a desktop? Convert it to SQL? Which SQL do we convert it to? What about the fact that SQL isn't a real programming language? There's no debugger, no way of maintaining the code. A real problem. And finally, perhaps most embarrassing of all, what about batch processing? What about if you print 20 million bills a month? Does everybody have a desk jet on their desk? And when they can't come in, somebody else comes in to print 6,000 invoices because we have no batch processing anywhere in the system? The two-layer model is a real problem for big applications. Here's another way of thinking about that problem. This set of three pie diagrams shows where the cycles go in a classical application in three different environments. On the mainframe, all of the cycles go into database or application, because mainframes deal with block mode terminals and have no cycles to give to the user interface, even if they want to. That's one interesting aspect of looking at these three pies. 
The other interesting aspect, though, is looking at where the cycles go on the mainframe. They don't all go to the database. In fact, one of the reasons that relational databases have not just taken over on the mainframe is they aren't fast enough. Well, what does that mean, they aren't fast enough? It means the mainframe doesn't have enough cycles because we have to reserve some of the cycles for something other than the database. And what is that something? It's the application. Now, what does that mean, it's the application? Well, let's think about a business. For example, Microsoft. Microsoft is now a $4 billion company. For a large company, it's actually amazingly simple because most of our products are sold through channels of distribution, so our sales force is relatively small for our size. Let's suppose that a salesman at Microsoft actually does book a very large order. That order is going to be delivered in seven countries over a period of 18 months. How long does it take for that order to actually be processed? 18 months. And there are a lot of different steps. Credit has to be authorized, inventory has to be allocated, product has to be built, invoices have to be sent out, invoices have to be aged, commission checks have to be cut, but only after payment's been received, and so on. Who manages that process? Who keeps all those processes running? And the answer is the mainframe. That's what the mainframe really does. It runs the business. Now here's another way of thinking about that. Business process reengineering talks about the elimination of queues. It talks about the fact that the fundamental thing that makes processes take too long in an organization is the fact that an order goes to a credit authorization manager and sits on his desk till he gets to it. So in a business process reengineered world, we want more and more of that processing to be automated, which means that more and more of those queues that used to be handled manually are now handled automatically. They never come above the surface to be seen. Who's handling all those queues? Who's scheduling all those tasks? Who's managing all those processes? And the answer is the mainframe. So now we know what the mainframe does, and now we can see what the real application architecture model needs to be to enable that kind of a mainframe-centered world. Yes, there is an application. Yes, the application runs on the desktop and it provides the user with the facilities to navigate to a particular application in a windowed environment, to start applications up, to analyze data, and to control the presentation of that data. And yes, there is a database layer at the bottom. The interesting thing is the layer in the middle, the business rule layer. That's the layer that the mainframe is really about. The database exists to support the business rules, not the other way around. So now we can answer the second question. What does the server do? Now, the simple answer to this question, as you might guess by now, is that the server runs the business rules. But there's a little more to that than just saying it so quickly. Here is the way that data is distributed in most large organizations. A huge amount of data sits on the central mainframe where it's tightly controlled. And in most organizations, an at least equally large amount of data sits in the yellow circle on the outside where it's completely controlled by individual users and not shared. The problem is that there's nothing in the middle. Now let's see why this is a problem. Suppose you're part of a self-managed team. You've been told that when a customer calls up and complains that he really shouldn't be on credit hold, you're supposed to fix the problem. To fix the problem, you need to find out why is he on credit hold. To do that, you need to ask questions. When we built our first graphical desktop database product, we decided to call it Access. And the reason we did that is because customers told us that the number one problem that they wanted solved, the number one thing they wanted personal computers to do better, was to access data. So we built a product which makes it simple for users to formulate queries graphically without having to learn languages like SQL. Then through gateways, they can send ad hoc queries to the mainframe and they can run those ad hoc queries against the production database. Ask anybody responsible for running a production database how they feel about running ad hoc questions, ad hoc queries against their production database. The answer you're going to get is, you can't be serious. You must be kidding. There's no way it's ever going to happen. Because everybody knows that any one of those ad hoc queries could quickly drag down the entire database. 
So what we've got is self-managed teams without the ability to ask questions. How do we solve that problem? The answer is we introduce a new element. Now this particular diagram has an interesting color coding. The circle at the center is blue because I decided randomly that blue stands for centrally controlled. And then I asked our graphic artists and they told me that yellow is the complementary color to blue, so the circle on the outside is yellow. It stands for personally controlled, the opposite of centrally controlled. You'll notice two new circles in this diagram that are both blue and yellow. And no, they're not Lyman's, they're servers. The thing that is new about a server is that it's controlled both by the central organization and by the self-managed team. People ask me often, can a mainframe be a server? And the answer is, possibly, as long as it meets the three key criteria that define a server. The first is, a server must be cheap. Not inexpensive, cheap. It has to be cheap enough that when a self-managed team calls you up and says, our queries are running too slowly, our local procedures aren't running fast enough, you can say with a straight face and without a moment of hesitation, buy another server. The second thing that makes a server a server is the fact that it doesn't sit on a desktop. Because it doesn't sit on a desktop, it can be locked up. Because it can be locked up, it can enforce business rules. It can ensure that even if the local team writes their own business processes, that those business processes do not violate fundamental business rules. The third thing that makes a server a server is the fact that it's still a computer. It can run arbitrarily complex queries. Local teams can modify business procedures to meet their own needs. All of those things are possible because the server is, after all, a computer. So what we're basically saying is that self-managed teams require self-managed databases. We're talking about a world in which the business rules not only move from the client to the server, but the server moves out to where the users are. Now, for the first time, each team can ask as many questions as it wants. If the server gets overloaded, they get another server. Each team can modify, customize business procedures to meet local requirements. And no central organization has to try to figure out how to handle dozens, hundreds, thousands of local modifications into an already overloaded, already unmaintainable central system. So, what is client server really about? Not about the client. Client server is about the server. It's about the distribution of data. It's about the distribution of processing. And yes, I said it's not about the client, but it is also about the client. It's about the graphical user interface, but only third. So what makes client-server really different is distributed processing, distributed data systems. Now the next question is, how do we build those? Now before we answer those questions, I'd like to give one example, though, of what happens when you do build systems in this way, assuming you could figure out how to do it. And the reason I'd like to do that is I'd like to demonstrate from the beginning that this kind of an approach can not only lead to better organizations and better applications, but actually even to increase throughput. If you asked most people what they expect from the throughput of a client-server system, they'd probably tell you that they expect everything on the desktop to be really fast. They might tell you that transaction processing could be faster because transactions, after all, are really small and lend themselves to being distributed among a large number of machines. Then there would be a pause, and they would say, we don't know what to think about the large batch processes, the ones that run all night in the mainframe. How will we ever get those to run in a client-server world? Probably they'll always have to run in the mainframe. Well, one of our solution providers, a developer of large, sophisticated financial applications, has been using the three-layer application architecture that I've been describing for quite a while. In its most recent generation of products, is entirely crafted around that three-layer architecture. They took their largest, most complex, most compute-intensive batch process. This is a batch process that takes an invoice file, a file of unpaid bills, and analyzes the bills one by one to decide what to do. Should the customer be charged interest? Should he be put in credit hold? Do we need to send him a letter? And so on. Running this process against a real file with 650,000 invoices 
takes six and a half hours on a J-Class mainframe, the largest IBM made at the time. Because the application had been developed around the three-layer architecture from the beginning, with just a little work, they were able to convert it so that the same application ran with the database running in database servers and the compute processes running in business rule servers. The business rule servers in this case were 20, 66 megahertz, 486 machines. And because these are not database servers, they were desktop machines, not server machines, since they didn't have to have large or fast disk arrays. When they were done, they thought they would be lucky if the converted application even ran. Somewhat to their surprise, it ran. It ran really fast. It completed in half an hour. Instead of six and a half hours, 30 minutes. So I'm not saying that all batch processes will necessarily speed up this much, but the potential at least exists that even those tasks were the most afraid of converting once properly rewritten, once properly architected, may actually display not only improved interoperability, but actually may display significantly increased performance as well. Now we get to the trick question, the one you've probably been waiting for. So these new systems are neat. Turns out they revolve around distributed data. People have been talking about distributed data and distributed databases for 20 years. How come more of them haven't been built? In fact, can they even be built in the first place? And besides building them, how do we design them? Well, let's answer that question. Here's the question that I often get asked. I visit a customer, and they've developed a sophisticated data model, a sophisticated entity relationship diagram. And they want me to tell them, how can they convert that entity relationship diagram, which basically describes a centralized database, into a different entity relationship diagram that describes a distributed database, a distributed entity relationship diagram. What are the rules? What is the theoretical model? What is the methodology for converting that entity relationship diagram into a distributed entity relationship diagram? There isn't one. There's no way that I know of, based on a data model alone, to figure out how a database should be distributed. And the fact that people have been trying for 20 years and haven't been able to do it doesn't mean that if we keep trying for another 20 years, we'll figure it out. The answer is not in the data. The answer, instead, is in the processing. Figure out how to distribute the processing, and the data will follow along behind it. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's the answer, the same diagram we saw before. So let's suppose that senior management is doing their strategic planning. And you've decided, good decision, that you're not going to force them to work with entity relationship models if they're going to do strategic planning, because guess what? They're already doing strategic planning anyways, and you want to be invited to the party. So one of the acid tests, as they're working with their consultants and thinking about business process reengineering, is very early on, the consultants will use an example of a centralized process and see whether management is really willing to move it out to the field. They'll test whether management is really ready to decentralize to empower self-managed teams. Now what this looks like is that they will take a process like order processing, and as they're looking at the steps in the process and seeing how it interacts with other processes, they will ask the key question. How about if we processed orders at local field offices? Now, how about if you were sitting there and as they said, that's a good idea, you said, would you like us to figure out how to build the systems to make local order processing possible quickly. Senior management's going to suddenly be paying attention. You are now part of the process. And if you tell me that orders are to be processed in a local office, give me an entity relationship diagram or a data model and a little bit of time, I will very quickly tell you what data has to be moved out to the server in the local office to facilitate local order processing. So distribute your processing, and the data will follow. Now this is a very simple concept. Turns out to be relatively straightforward to apply. It has very fundamental implications. <clears throat> and the reason it has such fundamental implications is that it requires us to redesign our entire application development methodology. 
This is the way that a classical application development methodology works. There are a number of preliminary steps, and then we get into the core of the design, in which we go through two iterative looping processes. On one side, we develop the data model, iteratively. And on the other side, we develop the functional model, also iteratively. And in the classical design life cycle, that's all there is. Now, at this point, I'm going to introduce the dreaded O word, objects, because it turns out that what I'm going to propose is an object-oriented alternative to the classical life cycle we just saw, but objects with a twist. Several years ago, Business Week ran an issue in which they had, on the front cover of the magazine, a picture of a baby. The baby was assembling a small structure out of Lego blocks, and the title on the cover implied that in a few years, in fact by now, through the power of object-oriented technology, applications would be able to be built in no time at all, and maybe even by babies. Now, child labor law implications aside, one of the things that people have wondered about is, when will the revolution happen, and what will it look like? And one of the implications is that when the revolution happens, everybody will be doing object-oriented programming. In fact, most people assume that they will not be object-oriented until they're programming in either C++ or Smalltalk. There are two problems with this philosophy. The first problem is that C++ and Smalltalk are very difficult languages to learn, and in fact, beyond the ability of most commercial programmers. They're not bad languages, they're just complex, difficult languages for most people to learn. But the true problem is even more fundamental. Let's suppose that you're trying to convince your senior management to fund a whole-scale shift to object-oriented approaches. This shift is going to cost $5 million. Even for the largest of companies, $5 million is a significant amount of money. So you're trying to figure out what are you going to say to senior management to get them to be enthusiastic about approving this amount of money. So first you think about talking about the technical characteristics of object-oriented programming. You'll go before the CFO and tell them all about encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Now, aside from the fact that polymorphism is illegal in 47 states of the United States, he probably really doesn't want to hear about the technical characteristics of the movement. So next you think, well, gee, maybe what I need is examples. That's it. I'll give them some really good examples. So you get out all the object-oriented textbooks, and you flip through them looking for good examples. One textbook talks about embedded temperature controls in refrigerators. Another way, book talks about the way to have common slider bars across all of your graphical applications. And as you look at these examples one after another, the $5 million is disappearing right in front of your very eyes. So is there an alternative? Well, let's forget about object-oriented just for a second and try to ask ourselves, what could you say to senior management that would get their interest and see if that has any relationship to objects? Well, common manage, senior management is always frustrated by not having enough code reuse, by not having common procedures company-wide, not only in the computer, but outside it. So say that you could talk to senior management about company-wide credit authorization, company-wide shipment scheduling, company-wide manufacturing scheduling. Now that's really interesting. Well, if it turns out that company-wide credit authorization is a really interesting thing, why not have your objects relate to things like credit authorization? And that's exactly what I'm going to recommend. In fact, what I'm going to propose is this, that object orientation is not about programming. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Object orientation, at least as much, is about analysis and design. And to the extent that we can think about large-scale objects instead of small-scale objects, we have an ability to really do revolutionary things with an object-oriented approach. So here's our same diagram. Now looking at these diagrams, we see a number of processes. These are processes in the business sense, but they are also processes in the technical sense. They could, conceptually and mechanically, be processes running in an operating system on a client or on a server. And the question is, looking at, for example, delivery, is it an object? 
or is it a process? Well, it's certainly a process. And if we look at it technically, it turns out it encapsulates code and data. It can be arranged in inheritance hierarchies. And since we're talking about messages, the things that flow back and forth between the processes, we can even have polymorphism. So these things could, in fact, be processes. It's true. They might actually be written in COBOL. They could be written in FORTRAN. And if an apology is in order because of the fact that we're doing object-oriented development, building first-class, true, legitimate objects, and doing it with non-object-oriented programming languages, fine, let's apologize, get the bad feelings out of the way, and carry on with building better systems. What I'm saying is that the core, at the level of changing the business, facilitating self-managed teams, and shifting to client-server, is focusing first on very coarse-grained objects. And at that level, it's possible to make the shift to object orientation without learning new programming techniques. Now we're ready to look at our new client-server design lifecycle. Instead of two parallel processes, we have four parallel processes. Two of them are basically still the same, but the other two are completely new. First, we continue to have a data model. Focusing on the structure of the database continues, in fact, to be just as important as ever. However, in addition to the data model, we also now have a process model. The process model focuses on what used to be the functional model. It focuses on the interaction between the components, and as we drill down into components, we get smaller components inside all interacting with each other. Over at the right of the diagram, we see the architectural model. The architectural model provides the broad overview of how all the pieces fit together. It shows what the coarse-grained objects basically are and deals with the object decomposition of the system in the first place. Then we get to the really new box, the user interface. And there's a key point that I want to make about the user interface. Three of the models in this life cycle are analytic in nature. They're driven by the left side of the brain, right hand, left side. They're diagrammatic, they're based on tables, and they can be described in terms of numbers and pictures. The user interface, on the other hand, is very much of a right brain design process. It's an artistic process that is not driven by formal tools. Instead, it's driven by rapid application design, prototyping, and figuring out how things are by trying them. And that's the key point. We don't want to design entire applications that way, but we also want to recognize that the user interface can only be designed in that way. Looking back at our classical information engineering model, we find that most of the information engineering structure is actually still highly appropriate. The idea of information systems planning, followed by business area analysis, followed by business systems design, followed by business system construction, is still a very fine way to think about the world. Thinking about data modeling as one of the two key centers of the design approach, that's fine too. What's new is the word process. What's new is making the entire structure revolve around the concept of process along with the concept of data. And along with that is a new way of thinking about this. If you were to visit an architect, the architect would draw a wide variety of diagrams to describe a house that he might be building for you. A small number of those diagrams he would actually show to you. Floor plans, some layouts, and a large number of other diagrams, structural analysis, electrical analysis, and so on, would be for his use only. And in the same way, what this model here suggests is that there are a variety of approaches we take from the beginning that the data model is really for us, the process model is for everybody, and that that's still a fine way to think about the world. Now going back to our original 3x3 three three matrix, here's a way to think about the actual steps in the life cycle. We actually have three different parts of our application conceptually corresponding to the three layers. The database, the process layer where all the business rules live, and the desktop application layer where the user interface lives. As we move our way through the design process, we start out thinking about the application conceptually. 
we think about things like entity clusters on the database side, where things are the most technical and have evolved the most. On the UI side, we think about workflow. On the process side, we think about something called business process flow. Now, immediately, even looking at this, we can see an important conclusion. Many people assume that if we could think about workflow and had good enough workflow planning tools, good enough workflow design tools, we could, in fact, build big applications faster. In fact, business process reengineering suggests the very opposite. Workflow is about essentially automating the movement of messages and information from one person to another. It's about automating the transmission between manual processing of queues. Business process engineering, on the other hand, suggests that we want to eliminate those queues altogether. The less workflow, the better, which is why the central column is so critical. First do the business process flow design, not the workflow, and then whatever workflow is left, by all means, use workflow design tools to figure out how to do that workflow more effectively. In the logical layer, we see that we still think about the structure of an application in more detail before we start to build it. On the UI side, for example, we find for the first time the term form sequences. Most tools in the personal computer industry make it very easy to, to design forms, amazingly easy. The problem is that when you're designing even a medium-sized application, designing a form is the last thing you do, not the first. The first thing you do is think about how do all the forms fit together? How does the user move from form to form? What forms does he even need in the first place to do his task? And what we need are tools to allow us to do that level of design before we go down to the physical layer where we write code, actually populate database tables, and build specific forms. So that's an overall design model for building client-server applications. Now we get to the last question. Many times when I talk to people, when I get this far in the presentation, they say to me, what you've described is exciting, it's compelling, but is it real? It's really neat to think that I can now think about how to design a distributed application. It's nice to think that I can decide where to put the data and the processes, but everybody knows, don't they, that real distributed databases, real distributed processing can't be done. Well, let's see if that's true. It turns out that when I ask people why they think distributed processing can't be done, one of the terms that comes up amazingly quickly in the conversation is two-phase commit. And most people say to me something like this, two-phase commit. Can we live without it? And then on the other hand, if we had it, can we live with it? The reason they ask if they can live without it is because many people believe that two-phase commit, which is a coordination technology for allowing multiple databases to work together in processing a single transaction, is not broadly available. But we'll look at how two-phase commit works in a little more detail on the next slide. But the first point I want to make is the two-phase commit is in the process of becoming broadly available in a variety of forms. So if the reason that you're deciding not to build distributed systems is because you can't get two-phase commit, that is an assumption that is on the verge of becoming false, which leads to the next point. So then people say to me, OK, say we had two-phase commit. Isn't it true that in a two-phase commit world, I have data distributed all over the world. If any, if any server or any communications line goes down, and if I have enough interlocking transactions, eventually the entire network will grind to a halt. That's true. It's actually true in a two-phase commit world. So then they say to me, well, gee, wouldn't I be better off then just having some centralized mainframes? At least I can have two of them, and if one fails, the other can take over. That's true, too. And yet, there's something really troubling about this conclusion. All of us know, intuitively, that a distributed system ought to be more robust, more resistant to failure, ought to run more often than a centralized system. And yet, this supposedly complete technical analysis suggests the very opposite. How can that be true? Well, let's go back to our process interaction diagram, our object interaction diagram. And let's analyze some of the interactions that take place here to see what's at the core of two-phase commit 
and whether or not we really need it or some alternative. So let's look at the two bubbles near the top right. Let's suppose that you're designing a system and you're talking to senior business management. And you ask them the following question. Order processing is happening at local field offices. Credit authorization is happening at a central national location. So you say to them, is it true that if the credit authorization computer is down, you want to stop processing orders? And they think about it and they say, yes, that's true. So at that point, you need a real-time coordination protocol. Now let's, let's just spend a second thinking about what that means. A customer calls up to place an order. The order processing computer asks the credit authorization computer if the customer has enough credit. The credit authorization computer decreases the customer credit limit, but doesn't actually make it final until it's told that the order has been processed. The order authorization computer, on the other hand, waits to process the order until it knows that the credit is available and doesn't complete processing the order until the credit limit has been decreased. And we want to make sure that both the credit limit decrease and the processing of the order either both happen or neither one happens. So if a communications line or a computer goes down in the middle of the transaction, neither computer can finish processing that transaction until it hears back from the other one. And because the business manager said that he was willing to shut down order processing if something broke, we need two-phase commit. Great, I understand that. And if everything worked like that, it would be less reliable than a central site. Now let's look at the next case, same business manager. So now we've accepted the order and we're scheduling delivery. Do you want to not process orders if the warehouse computer that schedules delivery is down? He thinks about it and says, no, of course not. If the warehouse computer is down, book the order, and then when the computer comes back up or the communications line comes back up, send it to the warehouse so delivery can be scheduled. And get it there as soon as possible, but don't stop processing orders because the warehouse computer is down. Hey, guess what? We don't need real-time coordination. We don't need two-phase commit. Now, looking at another case, once we book an order, we arrange for an invoice to be sent. Invoices are sent once a month. Would we ever refuse to send an order because the computer that's going to send an invoice out later that month is down? Of course not. So it turns out when we analyze this process interaction diagram that, at least in my experience, over 95% of the time, we will end up labeling those lines with something other than real time. Over 95% of the time, ASAP is real enough time. Over 95% of the time, real enough time is good enough, and we don't need real time. We don't need two-phase commit. And distributed systems can be and are, in this environment, more reliable than centralized ones. So what we're really talking about, then, is that in order to make this work, what we need is not only a distributed database world, but in fact, a distributed process world. We need system infrastructural components to manage not only distributed data, but distributed processes. The co old concept of a TP monitor in its current form surely won't stay with us. Many people are moving to the client server world exactly to get away from the complexity of products like CICS and IMSDC. However, the larger scale concept of having a higher level entity that can manage the distributed processes extended over time certainly is an important part of the distributed process infrastructure of the future. The next question is, where are we? How real is this? I've suggested a way of thinking about client-server systems, a methodology for designing them, and a way of understanding some of the technical components required to actually build the systems of the future. What this graphic shows is a kind of a report card. It's neither a 2 by 2 nor a 3 by 3 matrix, but it shows where we are in terms of the state of the art. And what it demonstrates graphically is that comparing ourselves in the PC world to, for instance, mainframes. In 1985, probably the first time that MIS people started to think about taking PCs seriously, any comparison with the mainframe would have shown that even thinking about building serious applications 
in a PC environment was a joke. By 1990, the prospect had come tantalizingly close, and yet many of the pieces were still missing. Today, as we get closer to 1995, we see that the pieces are in fact almost there. So the question that you need to ask yourself is, let's say that you're building a next generation system. Let's say you're responding to the needs of business process reengineering. Do you want to build that system for today's technology or the technology that will be there at the time that your system is built and rolling out? I know that the answer to that question will not always be clear, but that is the key question. Now, how do we get through the process of answering that question and planning the systems? And basically, this is my concluding slide. That is that we really need to think about the change process in terms of three fundamental streams. First, an iterative planning cycle. The reason it's iterative is that the process we're moving through, a process of profound cultural shift, a process of establishing new paradigms, is one that will cause us to learn and reevaluate assumptions, learn and reevaluate those assumptions, and do that continuously. Secondly, Education plays a fundamental role in this process. In fact, one of the most fundamental problems that I've discovered is the existence of two camps, two cultures. A mainframe culture consisting primarily of people who have been in the computer industry for over 20 years and have learned a lot about building big systems. And a PC-based culture, by definition consisting of people who have been in the industry for less than 20 years who know, and who know how to build friendly, simple systems, but don't know how to think about databases or large application design. And then there's a third culture revolving around business process reengineering. And in fact, I found dealing with this educational problem such a challenge that one of the things I did during the last year was write a book whose primary intention was to help bridge the chasms between those three communities, the business community, the PC technical community, and the mainframe technical community. Whether you use that book, or whether you approach it through seminars, lectures, teaching materials, or videotapes, establishing that educational base, building those bridges, is fundamental to success. Finally, pilots. The Japanese have a concept of a risk list. It's the opposite of the American concept. American companies have a list of risks they want to avoid. Japanese companies have a list of risks they want to take. In order to be competitive, in order to move to self-managed teams, in order to build client-server systems, you have to manage your risks, which means taking them and taking them in a controlled fashion. Perhaps this slide reaches a little. It talks about reinventing the whole world. Obviously, we can't reinvent the whole world, but we can reinvent the whole computer world. And we can reinvent a large part of the business world. We're riding a 20-year wave. It requires us to re-examine fundamental assumptions. One question we might ask ourselves is how will people look at this wave when they look back at it after it too passes? Certainly, they'll look at the wave that took place in the 60s and 70s as a wave of corporate computing distant, inaccessible, batch reports, printed cards. And certainly, they will look at much of the last 20 years as revolving around personal computing, first in the form of time sharing, and then in the form of actual personal computers. And yet, very little of that changed people's lives. The real opportunity inherent in self-managed teams and some of the implications of this technology is that if we all build the kinds of systems we're capable of building, do the very best we can, people may in fact, for the first time, look at this 20-year period as one in which computers created personal empowerment and helped to change people's lives. Thank you very much.